Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Autobiographies. Thrills, money, and revenge. These are what drive the subject of tonight's episode. We will take a look at a criminal with mysterious motivations and whose sole loyalties lie only with himself. There will be many people on this program who we might call murderers or sociopaths, but of all those we might examine, there is perhaps none more psychotic or unhinged as the silent, deadly reaper man, otherwise known as Claude. This episode of Grand Theft Autobiography is brought to you by... Love Media, bringing people and the finest in entertainment together. Claude, otherwise known as the Reaper Man and the Handsome Handyman, first started his criminal career sometime prior to 1992. As by that time, he already owned his own garage and participated frequently in illegal street races across the state of San Andreas. Being incredibly skilled behind the wheel, Claude began to form connections in the criminal underworld of San Fierro through his then-girlfriend Catalina, but he would eventually lose it all in a race to Carl Johnson of the Los Santos Grove Street families when Catalina includes the garage as part of the ante. With his garage gone, Claude and Catalina would leave San Andreas in 92 to begin a nine-year-long crime spree across the United States, Bonnie and Clyde style. The number of robberies they committed together is unknown, but the two spent nearly the next decade making their way from Red County, San Andreas, all the way to Liberty City by 2001. However, all was not perfect in paradise, as Catalina would begin to develop a resentment for Claude which by 2001 had reached its boiling point. During a robbery of a Liberty City bank, Catalina betrayed Claude, shooting him in the chest and leaving him for dead. But if he had been an easy man to kill, he would have never made it as far as he did to begin with. Having survived Catalina's betrayal, Claude found himself detained and convicted by the Liberty State judicial system with a unanimous verdict guilty of armed robbery. During a routine transfer of several felons, including Claude, from Liberty State Penitentiary, the convoy was ambushed by the Colombian cartel, seeking to free an old oriental gentleman in the same paddy wagon as the handsome handyman. The Colombians, taking no interest in Claude or the other detainee, allow the two to escape by vehicle just before the Callahan Bridge is destroyed in an effort to prevent the Portland police from pursuing. With the help of Leone associate 8-Ball, who'd also been freed inadvertently by the Colombians, Claude fled the scene of his escape and began lying low at a safe house on the edge of Portland's red light district. With 8-Ball's endorsement to Leone club runner Luigi Godarelli, Claude would begin to work for the Mafia, doing odd jobs, mostly as a driver, but also occasionally a hitman and general cleanup for Luigi, who eventually put him in contact with the son of the family Don, Joey Leone, by the way of Joey's girl Misty whom Claude occasionally drove around the city. Claude would go on to assist Joey in stoking a war between the Leones and the rival family, the Ferrellis, as well as the Chinese triads by killing both Lips Ferrelli and Chunky Lee Chung, respectively. The Ferrellis were targeted for late payments owed to Joey, but the triads for another reason entirely. The Chinese had begun slinging a new drug called Spank in various parts of Chinatown, principally by Chung himself, 
and the drug's profits had begun to eat into the Mafia's own businesses. Impressed with Claude's competence, Joey would introduce Claude to Capo regime Tony Cipriani, who would accelerate the Leone's war against the Triads with Claude's help, culminating in the Don himself calling a meeting of all high-ranking Leone associates, with Claude serving as their chauffeur. So long, Salvatore, you've been away too you long. You tell them once this unfortunate business is taken care of, we'll all go down to the club and celebrate, okay? It's my boy. How you doing, Pop? You got yourself a good woman yet? Hey, your mother, God bless her soul, would be turning over in her grave to see you without a wife. I know, Pop. I'm working on it. Tony! How's your mama? She's a great woman, you know. Strong. Firenze. She's good. Having been personally introduced to the Don of the family, Salvatore Leone, Claude's future with the Mafia seemed bright with Salvatore himself saying he saw nothing but good things for you, my boy. With the trust of the Leones, Claude was tasked with driving Salvatore's girl Maria around town, who proceeded to have Claude drive her to her spank dealer, who in turn points them in the direction of a party taking place in Atlantic Keys. At the party, Maria would instruct Claude, whom she'd taken to calling Fido, to Wait here and look after my blood, right? But when the police raid the party, Claude is still able to get Maria out safely, and return her to the Don's mansion, where she thanks him for his services. Alan, you, you, know, you treat me really good with respect and everything. Angered by the encroachment on profits that Spank presents for the Mafia, Don Salvatore has Claude follow and kill a suspected rat inside the organization, a bartender working Luigi's Sex Club 7 named Curly Bob, who had been selling information on the Leones to the cartel, now being led by Claude's former associates Miguel and Catalina. Upon discovery of the cartel's Spank factory aboard a freighter in Portland Harbor, the mob would have Claude work with 8-Ball to clear the ship and plant a bomb inside, severely crippling the cartel's ability to distribute Spank in Liberty. Whilst working for the Leones and living in Portland, Claude also took on work from both Diablo gang leader El Burro, as well as local businessman Marty Chonks, who ran the bitchin' dog food factory in Trenton. I just got one little job for you before we can all celebrate. With a blow dealt to the cartel, Claude was told to do some final cleanup work for the Leones, before becoming a made man and getting anything you want. But a paranoid Salvatore, encouraged by an intention-starved Maria, had actually arranged for it to be Claude's last job. And it would have been if not for the guilty Maria confessing her blunder and helping Claude to escape Portland with the aid of an old Yakuza friend, Asuka Kesa. You better get out of here before we get more hysterical Italians wanting less friendly reunions. Now a marked man by every gang in Portland, Claude continued his criminal pursuits by working for the Yakuza in the form of both the assumed Yakuza leader, Asuka, and the Wakagashira, Kenji Kesa, her brother. Asuka first has him prove his loyalties to the Mafia are truly severed by killing the very man who forced him into his most recent exile, Don Salvatore Leone. I can give you work with our organization, but first you must prove to me that your ties with the Mafia are truly broken. Salvatore Leone will be leaving Luigi's in about three hours' time. Make sure he doesn't reach his club alive. Meanwhile, Maria and I will catch up on old times. Oh, Asuka, you've got a massager. That's not a massager. After killing Salvatore outside Luigi's Sex Club 7, Claude would continue seeking work on Staunton Island with his Yakuza connections, introducing him to corrupt police officer Ray Machowski and media mogul Donald Love. Experience has taught me that a man like you can be very loyal for the right price. He would help Kenji resolve a debt, as well as perform a prison break for the high-ranking Yakuza member, and then help Ray keep his cover from being blown before driving him to the airport to flee the city entirely. However, after supposedly failing a job for Kenji and then correcting the mistake, Claude, perhaps offended by Kenji's outburst, willingly took on a job from Donald Love to kill the Wakagashira under the guise of a Colombian cartel gang member in an effort to provoke a gang war and Nothing drives down real estate prices like a good old-fashioned gang war. Though Claude's motivations remain a mystery due to his ever-present silence. I've noticed the Yakuza and the Colombians are far from friends. Let's capitalize on this business opportunity. I want you to kill the Yakuza Wakagashira, Kenji Kassen. Kenji is attending a meeting at the top of the multi-story car park in Newport. Get a cartel gang car and eliminate him. The Yakuza must blame the cartel for this declaration of war. 
Whilst on Staunton, Claude would also find work with King Courtney's Uptown Yardies, performing drive-bys on Diablos, and stealing vehicles for false flag hits on every gang in the city. I want you to steal me some gang cars so we can do some naughty thing on our enemy turf. I want me a mafia sentinel, a Yakuza stinger, and a Diablo in front of so we can hit up any gang in liberty. Drop them off at the garage in Newport and hear this. They're no use to be all broke up now. Before being lured into a trap on Catalina's orders and nearly being killed by drugged up suicide bombers loaded on Spank. Through the employ of Donald Love, Claude would eventually be tasked with retrieving a series of packages later revealed to be decoys until being told to retrieve the real package which had been on the plane all along. Unfortunately, despite Love's precautions, the plane was indeed seized by the police and held until Love paid off a substantial bribe. With the package secured in a hangar at Francis International, Claude drove to Shoreside Vale to extract the mysterious briefcase, but upon arrival was greeted by the Colombians once again. After clearing the hangar of the cartel gang members, Claude would search the Dodo airplane where the briefcase was meant to be before coming up empty-handed, but after spotting a Panlantic construction van still present at the scene, Claude would take the initiative of tracking down the package, driving to the Panlantic construction site on the north side of Staunton Island. After making his way through more cartel gang members, Claude would take the service elevator and come face to face for the first time in weeks with his traitorous ex-girlfriend and former associate, Catalina and Miguel. While Miguel attempted to de-escalate the situation, Catalina was outraged at Claude's survival and willing to do whatever she had to do to escape, resulting in her shooting another former partner, this time in the back, before leaping from the building into a pile of boxes below, just barely missing the arrival of a vengeance-hungry Yakuza boss. This worm killed my brother. I never killed no Yakuza! Liar! We all <sighs> saw the cartel assassin. We are going to hunt down and kill all you Colombian dogs. I'll be operating on our friend here to extract information oh, and oh. a little pleasure. You, drop by later. I'm sure I'll require your services. Please, amigo! Oh, don't leave me here with her, man. She's, she's psycho, chico, man. Please, amigo! Hey! Hey, amigo! Amigo! With the cartel's sight seized by Asuka's men, she would once again employ Claude to assist her in an all-out war against the cartel sending him on various missions to halt the production and distribution of Spank. During this time, Claude also found employment with the Southside Hood subsect, the Red Jacks, through their leader D-Ice, and assists them in dominating rival subsect, the Purple Nines, in Wichita Gardens. Our real drive-by work. Take these nines off ahead. Watch your back, though. There'll be jacks on the street who think you're trying to blast them, too. After killing Yardy dealers, destroying coffee stands covertly pushing the drug, and eventually intercepting and destroying an entire cartel shipment of Catalina's poison. Claude returned to the construction site to find Miguel and Asuka both dead, Miguel impaled on the whipping stick Asuka had been torturing him with, and a ransom note pinned to the top. Yes, idiot. One of these scarface idiots. Either out of a desire for revenge, or truly wanting to rescue Maria, Claude went to the Colombian-controlled mansion in Shoreside Vale with ransom money in hand, but as Catalina put it, To have learned, I'm not to be trusted. And quickly, a chase ensued with Catalina fleeing, Maria and money in hand, towards the Cochrane Dam, while Claude liberated his killers of their weapons and followed Catalina's escaping helicopter. After fighting his way through dozens of heavily armed Colombians, Claude would finally rescue Maria and blast Catalina's chopper right out of the sky creating an unprecedented fireworks display for the barely weary residents of Wichita Gardens. Residents in Cedar Grove have been coming to terms with the emotional aftermath of a full-blown war that hit the area yesterday. Local resident Clive Denver described to police a single gunman that he saw fleeing the scene with a dark-haired woman. Oh, you know, we're gonna have such fun, because, you, know, you know, I love you. I, I really do, because you're such a big, strong man, and that's just what I need. Anyway, what was I saying? Uh, you know, I forget, but you know what it's like, don't you? The sound of explosions shook nearby homes as people ran for cover. Several citizens were injured in the panic as gunfire was exchanged between ground forces and a helicopter circling the dam. Yeah, we got a good view from down here in the gardens. When the copter finally got taken out, better than the fireworks on the 4th of July. With the death toll already over 20, police are still finding bodies. There have been no official denials concerning rumors that the dead were members of the Colombian cartel and still no leads as to the cause of the massacre. My broken nail and my hair is ruined. I mean, 
mean, can you believe it? This one cost me 50. Claude is a serious man with a serious temper, though you wouldn't necessarily know it just by looking at his usual glare and smirk. Easy going for a criminal as long as you don't insult or betray him, Claude seemingly isn't bothered by much and adapts rapidly to his environment, always displaying a cool, calm demeanor, even when provoked. As long as paper exchanges hands in his favor, Claude will take any work from anybody in the criminal underworld, without a word of complaint or sign of reluctance. However, he has been known to take slights, even from those who employ him, very seriously. As theorized by Carl Johnson, Claude is likely a mute as he never speaks more than a grunt or an when seriously injured, keeping his expression cold and near emotionless, only using the occasional head nod to show he understands, unless in special ceremonial circumstances. Due to this fact, much of Claude's motivations remain a mystery, but his actions speak well enough for his character to establish some basic certainties. He will not hesitate to flip the bird to anybody on the streets of liberty and presumably anywhere, letting them know exactly what he thinks of them. He's also been shown to have a somewhat juvenile sense of humor, enjoying intimidation and acting both to some extent. Before his girlfriend's betrayal, the Drifter's intentions remain mysterious, but following it, Claude becomes single-mindedly determined to seek out his revenge, proving the ambition that Catalina ironically claimed to have not seen in him when she decided to leave him for dead in the first place. I'm an ambitious girl. You're just small time. Claude is a tall Caucasian male likely in his late 20s or early 30s by 2001. He has short brown hair and a slightly muscular build, and seemingly always wears a black leather bomber jacket with bronze zippers and a black t-shirt under it, plus green cargo pants and a blue pair of sneakers. A full rap sheet for the man identified as Claude has been obtained for this program. Compiled across many sources and reports over the years, these are all the known crimes that we were able to confirm that he has committed. Taking part in an illegal race in Red County, San Andreas, the robbery of a bank in Liberty City, and escaping when the police convoy taking him to the prison is attacked by the Colombian cartel, killing a drug dealer and stealing his car for Luigi Godarelli, killing two pimps, driving several prostitutes to the old school hall, stealing Mike Ferrelli's car, arming it with a bomb and using it to kill Mike, killing Lee Chung, damaging and stealing a secure car for Joey Leone, driving Tony Cipriani to a laundry to rob and helping him escape, disposing of a body in the trunk of a car, being the getaway driver for a bank robbery, destroying three laundry vans, stealing a briefcase from the triads for Tony Cipriani and killing all the triads guarding it, driving Maria Latour to a drug dealer and to a party which is busted by the LCBD before helping her escape, killing three triad warlords, the bombing of the triad's fish factory, killing Curly Bob, helping Eightball to blow up the Colombian cartel's ship, killing all the guards in his way, taking part in an illegal street race in Portland, arming an ice cream truck with a bomb and using it to kill several mafia members, killing 25 triads with a flamethrower, killing the thief of El Burro's porno magazines, bringing a bank manager to the dog food factory to be killed by Marty Chonks, bringing two thieves to be killed by Marty Chonks, bringing Marty Chonks wife to be killed by him, bringing Carl to be killed by Marty, although he is the one who ultimately kills Marty, killing Salvatore Leone, killing several spies located around Southern Island, killing a reporter, killing Tanner and escaping from the LCBD officers pursuing him afterwards, breaking Kanbu out of prison, stealing three sports cars for Kenji Kassin, ambushing a deal between the Colombian cartel and the Yardies, killing all the participants and stealing their money for Kenji, collecting protection money for Kenji and killing several Diablo members who attempt to stop him, killing numerous Yardie drug dealers, torching Leon McCaffrey's house and almost killing him, killing several Colombians attacking Phil Cassidy, damaging a vehicle and collecting evidence against Ray Michalski that falls from it, before torching the car with the evidence, evading the LCPD in the process, killing Ray's partner, damaging an ambulance, killing Leon McCaffrey and escaping from the LCPD, killing several Colombians in order to save the old oriental gentleman and bring him to Donald Love, killing Kenji Kaysen and framing the Colombian cartel for the attack, picking up six packages with illegal goods for Donald Love and escaping from the LCPD, killing several Colombians protecting a plane at the airport and more at the construction site in Fort Staunton in order to steal their package for Donald Love, defending a secure car from the Colombians killing some of them in the process, acting as a decoy and distracting the LCPD for three minutes, helping Ray Machowski escape from the LCPD by taking him to the airport, leading several Colombians into a trap to be killed by the Yakuza, destroying nine espresso stands operated by the Colombians, destroying a plane in order to steal its packages of spank for Asuka Kazan, 
taking part in an illegal street race in Staunton Island, killing 10 Diablos, stealing three gang cars for King Courtney, killing several spanked up madmen who attempted to kill him and destroying their vans, killing 25 Purple Nines, destroying three gang cars with an RC bandit, picking up numerous packages of bullion for D-Ice, killing the remaining Purple Nines with a baseball bat, and killing Catalina by destroying her helicopter, along with numerous Colombians in retaliation for her betrayal and in order to save Maria Latour. When all is said and done, the known tallies for Claude are a clear reminder of the true depths of depravity America's criminal underworld are capable of, with Claude's estimated murders alone counting nearly 180 people. Unlike future subjects on this show, whose motivations are clearer and easier to understand, Claude's unwavering silence means his reasons for such profound death and destruction are, and will remain, a mystery. God only knows what goes on behind those cold, calculated eyes. America is a dangerous place, folks. And tonight was just one example of a psychotic killer who might just be coming to your neighborhood soon. Stay indoors, people. Lock your doors and don't ever come out. Not even if grandma needs a medication. I'll see you next time on Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. <laughs>